Greetings! This is Marcus Manilius in his book called, which he titled, Astronomica. Let's start with line 358, shall we? <clears throat> Weak is the connection between alternate signs, nor do they maintain with unfailing constancy the federation between each other, because the line is reluctant to bend in its circuit of short chords. A track is formed which passes by one constellation at a time, whilst the angle lodges at alternate signs, the line making six changes of direction in its curve round the circle. It therefore leaves the bull for the crab, then after touching the virgin, enters scorpion, thence reaches you, chill Capricorn, from you the two fishes and the stars of the bull averse, and finishes the circle where it began. The path of a second line lies through the signs that the first missed and is drawn in such a way that you pass by each of the signs I mentioned, so that its circle resembles the former in having as many chords. Signs separated by one intervening sign are concealed in a curved recess, and so, though, though they follow the one in front, they escape its slanting gaze, since, lying at an angle too obtuse, they are only to be seen with sidelong glance and are hidden from their neighbor. Sight strikes more surely straight ahead. And because their line comes close to the celestial vault, since in its circuit it only passes over one sign at a time, their sight of each other takes place at a great distance from us, ranging over the heights of heaven, and the influences it radiates from afar are faint when they reach the earth. However, federation exists among them by virtue of their affinity, for the signs that are connected are not of unlike sex, but masculine respond to male, whilst the remainder are of female sex and form among themselves a heavenly fellowship. Thus is it that, though the signs of hexagons are alternate, their nature is similar, and as kindred stars they acknowledge the ties of sex. But no friendliness towards one another has been granted to adjacent signs. Sympathy between them is blunted because the sight of each other is denied them. Their attentions are bestowed on different signs which they can see. Again they are signs of opposite sex, linked male to female right round the circle, and each in turn is forever beset by its neighbors. Sixth signs, as well, are not reckoned as capable of any influence, because their line is not traced through the whole circle in equal lengths, but strikes two signs with four intervening, whilst the third side does not fit in, the, in since the circle is exhausted. <clears throat> but the signs which shine from opposite quarters, poised with faces confronting each other across mid-sky, and remain at two extremes which all heaven between are seventh signs. Though remote from each other by position, they nevertheless exercise influence from afar, and furnish their powers in war and peace, at the bidding of the times, for now the planets proclaim alliance, and now strife. Wherefore, if perchance you wish to recount the names and abodes of the opposite signs, be sure to match midsummer against winter, Capricorn against Cancer, the Ram against the Balance, Night and Day, and each are equal, Aragon against the Fishes, the Lion against the Youth with his urn. When Scorpion shines overhead, the Bull is in the depths, and the Archer sets as the Twins rise above the earth. But though sign facing sign they shine opposed, Yet because of their nature they are oft born in alliance, and a mutual sympathy brings up between them, linked as they are by the tie of sex. Even in these circumstances, male calls to male at once with him, and the other signs to their own sex. The fishes and the limbs of the virgin fly in opposition, but cherish the bonds they share, and the tie of sex prevails over location. But over this tie, in turn, the seasons prevail. Cancer resists Capricorn, though females both, since summer conflicts with winter. 
The one season brings frost and ice, and a countryside white with snow, the other thirst and sweat, and an earth with hillsides parched, and the chill wintry night rivals in length the summer's day. Thus nature wages warfare, and the year is split in faction. So wonder not at the signs so situate doing battle. But the ram sign and Libras do not engage in total combat. For though in point of season spring differs from autumn, the one fills the earth with fruit, the other with flowers. Yet it enjoys a like principle, seeing that day is leveled with night in each. And the seasons, which are harmonious in their likeness of texture, and, as links joining winter and summer, maintain with the same tenor on either side days of identical blend, bringing it about that constellations refrain from clashing in violent warfare. Such is the scheme to be found in confronting signs. What step must one take next, when so much has been learnt? It is to mark well the tutelary deities appointed to the signs and the signs which nature assigned to each god, when she gave to the great virtues the persons of the gods and under sacred names established various powers, in order that a living presence might lend majesty to abstract qualities. Pallas is protectress of the ram, the Cytherian of the bull, and Phobius of the comely twins. You, Mercury, rule the crab, and you, Jerp Jupiter, as well as the mother of the gods, the lion. The virgin with her sheaf belongs to Ceres, and the balance to Vulcan who wrought it. Bellicose Scorpion clings to Mars. Diana cherishes the hunter, a man to be sure, but a horse in his other half and Vesta, the cramped stars of Capricorn. Opposite Jupiter, Juno has the sign of Aquarius, and Neptune acknowledges the fishes and his own for all that they are in heaven. This scheme, too, will provide you with important means of determining the future when, seeking from every quarter proofs and methods of our art, your mind spades among the planets and stars so that a divine power may arise in your spirit and mortal hearts, no less than heaven may win belief. Now learn how parts of the human frame are distributed among the constellations, and how the limbs are subject each to a particular authority. Over these limbs, out of all the parts of the body, the signs exercise special influence. The ram, as chieftain of them all, is allotted the head, and the bull receives, as it is his estate, the handsome neck. Evenly bestowed, the arms to shoulders joined are accounted to the twins. The breast is put down to the crab. The realm of the sides and the shoulder blades are the lions. The belly comes down to the maid as her rightful lot. The balance governs the loins, and scorpion takes pleasure in the groin. The thighs high to the centaur, Capricorn is tyrant of both knees, whilst the pouring waterman has the lordship of the shanks, and over the feet the fishes claim jurisdiction. Moreover, the stars have agreements among themselves according to special laws, and so enjoy fixed associations. Upon each other they direct their gaze, and to each other give ear, else they bear hatred or friendship. Some are introverted, and in yielding to their self-esteem are drawn into themselves. And so sometimes good will exists between stars that are opposed, and war is waged between signs and alliance. Signs which share no ties of place beget men attached in lifelong friendship, and men born of triangles fight and shun each other in turn. For, when God bought, brought the whole universe under law, he also set the signs at variance by distributing the affections among them. He linked the eyes of some, the ears of others. He joined these in the bonds of lasting friendship, those in the discord of endless wrangling, that some might see and hear each other, other might love or cause injury and war, and that others might cherish an addiction to their own natures, ever in love with themselves and finding favor in their own eyes. We see most men with dispositions such as these. They owe their natures to the stars that give them birth. <clears throat> as befits a leader, the ram is his own counsel. He listens to himself, 
and beholds the balance and his love for the bull thwarted. Against him the bull weaves a net of deceit and hears the twin fishes with which shine beyond the ram, whilst his heart is entranced at the sight of the maid. Thus thrilled, once long ago, was in serving Jove's disguise, he had borne Europa on his back, as with her left hand she clutched his horn. The hearing of the twins is drawn to the youth, who pours for the fishes a never-ending stream, their hearts to the fishes themselves, and their eyes to the lion. The crab and the sea goat sign placed opposite turn their eyes upon themselves, at one another strain with their ears, whilst the waterman is taken by the wiles of the crab. But the lion joins his gaze to that of the twins and his hearing, for he too is a fierce star, to that of the centaur and loves the sign of Capricorn. Aragon looks at the bull, but hearkens to the scorpion and endeavors to plot deceit against the archer. The balance heeds his own counsel, and has embraced with his gaze none but the ram, and with his heart the scorpion beneath. The latter beholds the fishes and listens to her who is Libra's neighbor. The archer, moreover, has grown used to waiting on the mighty lion, with his ears and beholding the eyes of the pot that the waterman empties. He adores Aragon all of, <clears throat> alone of all the stars. Capricorn, on the other hand, turns his gaze upon himself. What greater sign can he ever marvel at, since it was he that some propit propitiously upon Augustus's birth, and catches with his ears the height of topmost cancer? And now to the twins does the waterman incline his ear, he naked too. He worships the crab on high and contemplates the drawn bow of the archer. The fishes have fixed their glance upon the fierce scorpion and crave to listen to the bull. These are the reciprocal connections which give nature, which nature gave to the signs when she put them in their positions. Men born of these signs display the corresponding feelings towards each other. Some they love to hear and others they love to behold. They set traps for these and are ensnared by those. Now there are trigons alternate to trigons, which move in hostility to each other, and one of the two diameters leads them to war along opposed paths. Thus the design of truth is consistent in every part. For indeed, the ram, the lion, and the archer, allied trigonal signs, reject federation with the balance holder, and all his trigon, a trigon completed by the twins and the waterman pouring his stream, and a twofold reason compels us to admit the truth of this, because the signs shine in diametric opposition, three against three, and because of the eternal state of war between man and beast. And the beasts give way because intelligence prevails over brute strength. As one vanquished shines the lion among the stars, it was the theft of his golden fleece that gave the ram his place in heaven. To part of himself the centaur gives way on account of his rear, to such an extent is manliness restricted to man. Why should I wonder then that man born under the signs are no match for Libra's trigon? Nor is it the only reason which imparts enmities to men at birth and begets a race for mutual hatred and hostility, but alternate signs mostly abide in a state of antagonism being rooted with evil sidelong stairs, and because signs alternate to whatever signs are diametrically opposed and, separated by five, exchange confronting looks belong to, the, belong to the trigons of each. So one must not wonder if signs deny peace to those stars which possess trigonal relationship with their confronting signs. A simpler reason is also to be traced in the zodiac. For to all the shining signs endowed with human form, those of the beasts are ever hostile and never by them vanquished. Nevertheless, there are individual signs which follow their own caprice and, having private foes, wage wars of their own. And that is a little excerpt from Marcus Manilius's Red Book.